I still feel really bad about this. I opened my father's wallet. He was sleeping. Mm. He was sleeping. I opened his wallet. I took out around 600 ringgits. I took okay. out around 600 ringgits. <laughs> and then I paid it to the guy. The next day, he brought me three grams of mushrooms. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today we have two powerful stories. Two people who came from a proper good Islamic families, but unfortunately, because of their uh, friends and other circumstances, they went into addiction, drugs, and many other things. They shared their stories with us today and they told us the very details of their stories for us to learn from them. So I hope you enjoy this episode and now let's start. I was very lonely in that school. I had no friends at all. My childhood friend, my best friend, he was still in that school. I had to switch to another school. So you switched to another school? Yeah. My second school. The third school? No, no, the second. Okay. The, the first one is where my best friend, uh, where my childhood friend still is. Okay. The second one is the one where I was ignored. So uh, at that school, again, I was... I wasn't bullied physically, but mentally it was horrible. There was no one to talk to. And then at that time, my parents, they got very busy with their business. So they didn't have enough time for me. My dad would leave home at 7 a.m., 8 a.m. He would come back 10 p.m. So by that time, I would be asleep. Is, is that the school that you did drugs the first time? Yeah. So take me through it. How, how, was, how was it? So this is how it started, okay? I was very lonely and very depressed. And then uh, I met this guy. He was my senior. He was four grades above me. Okay. He was my senior. He was smoking in a corridor. Uh, along the hallway, mm -hmm. there's a little corridor, which has a lot of windows. So if you smoke there, like, it, no, one no one will smell it. I was passing through the corridor. He, he called me. He called me. He was like, come here. Since I was very lonely, someone called me in a very long time. I was very happy. In my head, I thought I was going to get friends. I went in. He was like, take this. Cigarette. Oh, you did? Okay. So, it was, it, it's called castor. Castor cigarettes, which are like sweet. Sweet flavored. So, he said, take this. It was the first time smoking cigarettes. I smoked it. I coughed a lot. I felt it in my lungs. It was horrible. I gave it back to him. I said, I do not like this. And then a few weeks passed. I saw this guy again in the toilet, vaping. Mm. <laughs> he called me again. <laughs> again, I was very happy. I went, he said, try this. It, it's called ice cream chocolate or something, the vape flavor. I took a puff. I loved it. Mm. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Then from that time onwards, I, I started to buy more chocolate-flavored uh, vapes, cigarettes. They're cigarettes that has chocolate flavor. It's like very thin, very long. I would be smoking that. I was not smoking a lot, one cigarette a day, but I was 12 years old. So I was smoking, smoking, smoking. Then a few months later, it was my exam time, mm -hmm. my examination. And since I was with a bad company of people, my grades were going down. Okay. My grades were going down very bad. I was more depressed. I, I took the exams. A few weeks later, the results were going to come out. When I got the results, I failed two subjects, maths and science. I was extremely depressed. I was like, how will I show my parents this? I've never failed a single subject before in my life. I met the guy again outside school. <laughs> he was sitting near a bus station. The bus stations in my country, they're mostly empty. He was sitting near a bus station. He was rolling a joint. We, I, I sat right beside him because we became friends. I sat right beside him. I said, what is this? I've never seen this before. 
I said, what is this? He said, oh, you got to try this. I said, okay, but what is this? He said, it's just tobacco and some leaves. I was like, okay, oh. well, sure, whatever. After we finished rolling, he lit up the joint. He took like he took like three, four puffs. Then he passed it on to me. He showed me exactly how to do it, how to smoke. Cause, like, when when you smoke it, it hurts your throat, mm-hmm. and then you cough a lot. Since it's uh, it's my first time, of course I hurt my throat. I took one puff. I I inhaled it very deeply, and I held it in. And then it felt like there was something lodged in my throat. Something lodged? Yeah, like something blocking my throat, oh. a windpipe. Okay. So when I let it out, I was coughing a lot. Coughing, coughing, coughing. Three, four minutes later, the whole world started spinning around me. <laughs> Uh, he didn't know at that time he didn't even know that I, I didn't know I didn't know what weed was I didn't know what drugs were so I took another puff that day I finished half the joint he finished half the joint I was so high I could I was scared to go home because my parents they, they would they would know exactly what what's wrong with me so what I did I told my friend there is a uh, there is a mosque in my uh, city near my house just drop me at that mosque he sent me to the mosque. I was so high, I forgot how to walk. I had to crawl inside the mosque. Mm. On the road, I was crawling with my knees down. You know how dogs crawl, right? I was crawling exactly like that. This continued on for months and months. And then, I turned 16. No, but this was like when you were like 13. 13. So from 13 to 16. I was on weed. How often? Every day. Oh, every day. Every day with him, I would be smoking. Mm. But I would I would not smoke a lot. Half a joint, one joint a day. No one from your family knew. No one from no one. Knew. They did not. They did not get any smell. Because after smoking, I would shower myself with perfume. Mm. <laughs> I, I would be chewing gums all the time. They did suspect something, because I was always chewing gum. I never chewed gum. I hate gum. But I was always chewing it. This went on for months. Years. And then after that, uh, the effect of weed did not work on me anymore. I was not getting high. I got high for like 10-15 minutes. Then it went straight down. So I was looking for something stronger. Something that would make me high for a long time. I asked with this guy. He said, there's a thing called psychedelics. Mm-hmm. Mushrooms, LSD. What's this? Uh, you have to eat this. LSD you put under your tongue, it messes with your head. Some people, they use it to expand their mind, expand their brain. But me, I was abusing it. Because the, the only thing I wanted, I wanted to get high. So he told you about them? Yeah. Did he give you? I, I told him I want some. He said... This stuff is very expensive. Mm. I said, okay, how much? He was saying three times, four times the price. I was like, okay, fine. I'll figure out a way to get your money. From from the day I was born until I was 16, I've never stolen money. But that day, I still feel really bad about this. I opened my father's wallet. He was sleeping. Mm. He was sleeping. I opened his wallet. I took out around 600 ringgits. Uh, it's uh, roughly, in my, in my currency, it's like 7 lakhs. I took out around 600 ringgits. And then I paid it to the guy. The next day, he brought me 3 grams of mushrooms. 3 grams, like 4 sticks, 4 mushrooms. Okay. And then he showed me exactly how to use it. I took it. I took only two grams. Aki, I was flying. It, it, everything was warped. You know, like, wiggly wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> everything was wiggly wobbly. Everything was wiggly wobbly. Okay. Do you, if your face was straight, I would be imagining you as, like, you're smiling. There's nothing on the floor. 
I would see cockroaches, I would see snakes. I would be hallucinating. <sighs> so, first time I tried it, it was an awesome trip. So I got addicted. Crazy addiction. I told him, I need more of this. I need something stronger than this. I did not want to steal money anymore. So what I did, I was selling. Back in my country, I was selling it. Mm. Again and again, I would be selling it. You would get from him and then you would sell it? Yes. To buy more of it? To buy more of it. And where would you take it? Like, at that, the, you were living with the family at that time? Uh, the, the, so we, we lived in a very old house. Under our house, there's uh, meter boxes. Mm. Meter boxes, like, uh, it's a box that shows you how much electricity you use. It's uh, my, my parents locked it in a wooden box. So uh, I broke the lock. And then I replaced it with another lock. So I had the key. Mm. I, I put it in there and then I just lock it. So no one can open it. Even and then, when you use yourself, when you would use the drug? Yeah, I would open it. I would use it down the stairs, in the stairs. Okay. Because I couldn't take it upstairs. I would use it in the stairs. I would throw the the plastic bag mm. in the gutter. Because in front of our house, there's a small gutter. I would throw it inside the gutter. Then I would go up, and when I reach upstairs, I would be high. Oh, so you'd interact with your family while you were high? I'd, I, I never, uh, no. Since I was 13, since I started weed, oh God, the tafsir, everything gone. Even the salah, I stopped praying. Actually, my mother was very strict. Mm. She made me memorize the most important surahs in the Quran. The whole surah, surah Yasin, surah Rahman, surah Mulk, surah Mudassir, surah Muzammil. The last, the last juice, juice 30, she made me memorize all of it. It was amazing back then. It was, it was really amazing. And then after I got addicted, I stopped reading Quran, I stopped praying Salah. I would go home very late. My parents would be very worried. My dad was also late, so... Never really knew what was going on. And then there's my brother also. Uh, when I was young, he never really cared about me. <laughs> yeah, you don't even know I'm home, so... Okay, so we'll stop there, and we'll go okay. back to you. So what about you? How was your start into it? So I came here again when I was 21. I came to Malaysia. I, I started, like... When I came to Malaysia, I completely stopped everything again. Mm hmm uh, because of my health issues and whatnot. Came here... You stopped for how long? About three, four months. Okay. Stopped for, for about three, four months and then came here... Did you feel any withdrawal effects when you stopped? No. I guess I guess the fact that, you know, when I came was during COVID, right? So I had to stay in quarantine mm. for two weeks. Or two weeks. Yeah, it was two weeks then. I stayed in quarantine for two weeks. Uh, it was a full stop. Everything. Maybe I felt withdrawals here and there, but I was sleeping every day for like two weeks. So obviously I'm going to uh, forget like everything that I've been doing. I came back to university over here. And then uh, obviously I wasn't doing anything or any drugs or any of, any of that sort. But inside I still wanted to. I really wanted to. Three, four months I met a friend that I, I made when I was 16 and when I was in Malaysia back then again and the cycle started again oh he gave it to you yeah he met me he was like yo you wanna go we can it'll be just like old times we'll go we'll go have some fun and this guy was Muslim this guy was Muslim and he, he was like okay let's go let's go and we'll have a smoke and then uh, let's figure it out and the cycle started all over again when that started I just went back into the cycle. But even while, like, you know, at, at this age, I was 21. I was I was more uh, mature because I've learned from a, from mm. my past experiences. Every time I'd be smoking or I'd do any, all these sorts of drugs, but it would run in my head, why am I doing this? Why, like, to fulfill what? The, does it give me anything? Mm. To, does it make me progress in any way? doesn't but I still do it for a long time maybe for the first 
two two and a half years I was doing it continuously every day to the point my health issues even started coming back. I was going to the hospital, getting oxygen treatments done, because just so just so that I can avoid the the inflammations and the headaches and everything. So if it's affecting your health very, so badly, then why don't you stop it? Addiction. You can't. You could. You, you when you start doing these things, you're addicted to a point where you think is more necessary than being healthy. You start to value your life less because you start you started thinking these 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 things can make your life more valuable it doesn't it doesn't make your life valuable at all it, if any case it makes you less valuable when you're doing all these things or over, uh, over time like uh, if, if you remember i told you when i came to if i had come to Ma- malaysia and if the first thing that i did was go to a masjid Maybe yeah, my life would have changed that day, because it, like Islam teaches us very basic things to keep our life on track. Go to salah five times a day, mm. and and Allah will answer your prayers. Once you start forgetting that, all these all these things that Shaitan has created comes around you and is very easily attracting you. I didn't do it, so I was in that cycle for about two and a half years or so. And then I reached a point, like just very recently, uh, about a month ago, is when I, when I wanted to call it quits on everything. So, but uh, b- before a month ago, what made you want to quit? And I was, I was, it wasn't just okay. I was losing money doing all this, but I, it was, it was more of like I started to think, how long is this gonna go? How far? How it's not gonna take me far, but how long am I gonna? Avoid the fact that this is ruining my life. You can't avoid the question. It's not going to do anything good to your life. It's not going to. It's not going to make you more fulfilled. <coughs> it's not going to help you fulfill your responsibilities. None of that. Like as a man, we have responsibilities. When we are when we are when we are kids, we have responsibilities to learn. When you become an adult, you have responsibilities to take, take care of your parents, get married, have a wife, have kids. I was starting to think like that, and I was like, at what stage am I? I'm so far behind just because I can, I, I am deciding to do drugs every day. Even if it was smoker joint every day, it was still like it's still something that that breaks your focus, breaks your mind. It doesn't help you think straight. All of a sudden, you're lazy. You like, can't. Well, what's the worst thing that happened to you from the addiction? Laziness. You feel lazy a lot. Not, not just lazy in terms of like you know. It was lazy to the point you know you you know you don't you wouldn't even want to keep your surrounding clean. You'd live like an animal. You don't want you don't want to brush around your room. You don't want to you don't want to keep your room clean. You don't want to take a shower and smell good. <laughs> it reached a point where, like you know, you're you're lazy to the point you you basically don't want to live life. Uh. You want to do drugs because it, you think it it breaks it breaks all the problems away. It it really doesn't. It, just like a month ago, or so there was telling was. It, it, I had a friend with me as well who wanted to stop all this. We had a bunch of weed in in the room, and then. We we rolled we rolled up a joint, and he was like while I was rolling it up, he was telling me, "Is really, even if he smoked that joint, our problems aren't fixed by tomorrow." He was rolling it and telling me that it will not fix his <laughs> problems. Okay. You no, know, I was rolling it, and he was telling it to me. Okay, okay. And then I started to think, this is my only chance. If I choose right here. Maybe my my life is gonna get fixed, and then he had he like there was a bunch of weed. I took it all to my head and gave it to my told him, I don't care what you do with it. Flush it. Give it to your friend. Give it to your roommate. I don't care. Go and give it to them. This will be the last. And then I told him go and go and give it to them. He went out, gave it to some friend, and then he took wudu from the bathroom. I didn't know why he took wudu. Mm-hmm. He took wudu and he came back into the room. And in the, at that time, you were not praying. No, I wasn't praying at all. 
he came back into the room and then I decided, okay, I'll take the joint and I'll light it up. Mm. Lit it up and this guy, like while I wasn't looking, <coughs> opened up the Quran, started reciting in front of me while I had the joint lit up. And then I was thinking, okay, I have a choice now. And you're listening to him? Yeah, I'm listening to him recite. I was like, okay, I have a choice now. Either I choose right now or I go through another cycle of pain that I'll, I'm never going to get the years back again. But if I choose right now, maybe, maybe I can start. You know, I, I had, the moment I heard him recite Quran, I, had, I don't know why I had so much fear in me. I was starting to think, do you, is it really worth it smoking this joint to the point you want to disrespect the God who's given you so much? Because we have so much to bless ourselves for. We are, our, our bodies are perfect. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not lacking with anything. We, we've got everything that we ask for. We're eating our three meals a day. There are so many people suffering around the world. Everything was running in my head when he told me that. And when, he, when I heard him reciting, I just, I just tossed it out. That's the first time I've ever, I've ever even... And you know, that, that, that itself was shocking to me. And I was thinking, why was this shocking to me all this time? I just tossed it out. I told him, Assalamu alaikum, and I left his room. The next day was the first time I prayed Fajr in five years. The, f the first day I prayed Fajr in my room in five years. I prayed Fajr and I don't know why I started crying. I started crying and, and for some reason that Fajr prayer started giving me thoughts into my head. Started giving me thoughts and, and all of a sudden I was thinking... Obviously, this is not a mistake that, that all this happened within a few hours. This could have happened when I was 30. This could have happened when I was 35. This could have happened when I was 40. But it happened now. It happened now, so it gives me the opportunity now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decide from today that all it took, took was his Fajr prayer today. So from today, I'm going to try and pray every prayer I can. Because if I pray, if I pray this and God bless me this much, how much would he bless me if I did all five? That was, that was the only thought in my head. Uh, and when I started praying, Fajr every day was when I started real, uh, not every, uh, my fair five prayers, when I was trying my best to complete it every day. It was, was when I started, you know, having the right thoughts in my head. That you won't even believe it. Like, I met you one week after I started doing that, on 5th, in Madhuryu. And then when I met you, that was the first time I even made a friend who was, who was not doing anything other than drugs. And it, all these thoughts started to hit in my head. All it took was to go into a prayer room and start praying. Have the right people around you and then make, make these right decisions. Yeah. Right now, I'm, uh, maybe I'm thinking, okay, if I had chosen to pray, maybe I wouldn't have gone this way. But uh, I can't, I can't blame it. Maybe you, this was like learning this way for me was better than not learning at all. At least now I know, I know for a fact. If I choose to do wrong, these are the consequences. If I choose to do right, this is what, these are the possibilities. So my mind started working a lot more better that way when I stood, when I prayed that first fajr that day after deciding to stop. Subhanallah. We'll continue with. First started hard drugs, psychedelics, mushrooms, LSD. It was crazy. Mm. After that? During that time, I was studying for my IGCSE. So uh, I was a premature baby. I was born with seven months. Because when I was born, it was during the time of, uh, there was something like a tsunami. Tsunami was in 2007. Uh, before that, there was another storm, which was very severe. Mm -hmm. Because of the storm, I was born early. I was I was in an incubator. Mm. My parents said they could see the plates. There's a plate between the skull in the skull. Yeah, they, could, they could see it. Yeah, inside. It was very soft. Mm -hmm. They could see it forming. And my bones are very weak. So, uh... I was 16, and then uh, I had I was doing IGCSEs, 
and I had memory problems because of the problems. addiction. It was because of my uh, because I was premature. My oh, brain was not fully developed. Okay. So I have problem remembering stuff until this day. If I learn something today, I'll forget it tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, plus with these drugs, it was kind of helping me. You know, the psychedelics. When you take this, if you focus on something, you're completely focused. But then it helps you to focus more. It helps you to focus more. But then when the effect drops. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> mm. how, how does it feel when the effect drops? When the effect drops, okay, when you first take it, it's a huge toll on your body. Your body feels very tired, very heavy. <laughs> you're constantly smiling. Your your face is like smiling constantly. But uh, inside your brain, it's a roller coaster. If you're not focusing, it's a roller coaster. Mm. By roller coaster, I mean. Everything around you is uh, like something unique to you. I can see particles in the air, mm. the hallucinations. So uh, I was, uh, it was during IGCSEs. I stopped talking to everyone. It was during 2019, COVID. I stopped talking to everyone. Okay, I was doing IGCSEs. I left school. I left the school because I couldn't handle any more, any more of this uh, uh, bullying. ignoring, bullying, ignoring. So I left school. I started doing self-study. I was studying all day, every day. I had stacks and stacks of past papers, old papers, just piled up in my room. I was studying crazy. And then uh, after COVID, I was ready to take the exam. I studied for three years. Mm -hmm. I had to study for three years. Some people, they do it in two years. Most people. I mean, everyone does it in two years. I had to study for three years. After three years, I went to another school for the for, for taking the exam. I went to the school. It was it was an Islamic school. So it's, it's a very good school. I went to the school. I met a guy there. Every, most of the people there were Muslims. I met a guy there. He's he's now my best friend. He's an amazing guy. He helped me through my hardships. When I met him, I stopped taking the psychedelics. Sure, I was smoking weed, but I stopped doing hard drugs because I felt bad for him. This guy, he 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 doesn't stand beside someone who smokes. He doesn't like the smoke. He doesn't like the smoke. So I was respecting him a lot. He was my first actual friend. Mm -hmm. So I was respecting him a lot. He was your first actual friend? First actual friend. At the age of that time? Uh, at the age of uh, 18, 19, 18. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 18. He was my first actual friend. He was amazing. He is a very good guy. And then, uh, well, we, we hanged out every day in school. And then slowly by slowly, I was stopping everything. So it was all you were? I was stopping everything. Stopping everything? Because it's even smoking cigarettes. I was stopping mm -hmm. it. And then, before the exams, I stopped. Completely stopped everything. Because of him. And then, uh, after the exams, during the exams, like one month, I was very, very hyped, you know? I was very active, and I wasn't thinking about the drugs. So, it was not... Like, it was not a huge hole on my body. I, I did not feel any withdrawals. Sure, there were some withdrawals. Uh, I would shake a lot. But uh, it was easy to cope with because I was focused on the exam more. I needed to come to Malaysia. Actually, it was not Malaysia. I was going to go to Canada. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, we'll get to that part later. So I was very focused on the exams. I took the exams before the results came out. I was very stressed, extremely stressed. Uh, if I if I was if I had this knowledge I have now back then, I would be praying. I would be praying twenty four hours. But instead of praying, I I started smoking again, cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes, cigarettes, smoking, smoking, smoking. Then it went back to weed, again. Mm. So I was smoking weed, and then the results came up. Alhamdulillah, I had crazy good marks. 
<laughs> Crazy good. I never expected all the subjects I got above 95. Uh, then my dad caught me in my room. I had uh, Xanax pills. I had it hidden between the uh, aircon pipes. Okay. I had it hidden. And then uh, I was in school. They, they suspected something, my mom and my dad. So they did a police investigation. They became police themselves. Yeah, they checked everything. They they opened the bed sheets. They opened the pillows. They checked everything, and then they found a, they found ten pills of Xanax, inside the thing. So, I went back home. At night, I couldn't sleep, so I was like, "I'll take one pill. Why not?" I was looking for it. I didn't find it. I was very like scared, worried, uh, every every emotion at the same time. Who found us? Then I went to my dad, uh, my mom. I was like, did you, did you do something to my, to my room? She's like, who oh, asked your dad? I went to my dad. I asked him, did you do something to my room? Before he, he answered, he whooped me. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't tell me anything, he whooped me. I, I was very sure he found this. And then he said, you're never going to Canada. Because Canada, weed is legal there. You're never going to Canada. He sent me to Malaysia. He said in Malaysia, it's a very uh, strict for drugs. Mm. Straight up death penalty. So he sent me here. I came here. I had a very good mindset. Because I saw my parents this way. They were, my dad was crying. In his room at night alone. Oh, he was crying. He was room. crying because this is not something good. Mm. Okay. So I I came to Malaysia with an extreme good mindset. I was like, I will pray five times a day, every day. January, I was a very good Muslim, very good. I was praying every day. February, I met a girl. Mm -hmm. Actually, I did not meet the girl. The girl met me. So it was like this, okay. I went to a trip with my friend. It was a bus trip, just a tour around Kuala Lumpur, uh, KL. And then uh, he was like, there's this girl that I really get, like, that I really want to date. I was like, Aki, I don't know. I don't know how to talk to girls. I don't even know how to talk to people. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I met him. He was sitting beside me in the, in the bus. Okay, so... I told him, I don't even know how to talk to other men, other people. He was like, it's just over phone, text. You can do this, come on. So I was like, okay, fine, whatever. I gave him my phone. His own battery was dead. So I gave him my phone, I gave him my account. Then he was texting, texting, texting. And then I helped him with uh, the conversation. And then after that, we came back at like 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. He told me, go get dressed. Go we'll take a shower, get dressed. We're going. I said, where? I want to sleep. He said, we're going to meet this girl. She's waiting for me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, bro, you two are dating. Why Why are you calling me? What, what, what is this? And then he said, okay, fine. You bring another girl. I was like, what? <laughs> I was very confused. <laughs> so uh, I called my friend, my childhood friend. The one I was with in the first, uh, first school, right? Mm -hmm. I called him, I'm like, brother, come with me. This is very awkward. I'm a third wheeler. I, 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 this, is, this is not me. I called him. He came. He was a very good guy. When I first met him after a long time, he, I'm very proud of him. He was a very good Muslim. So uh, we went out together. And then a few weeks later, I met her in school. My school started, I met her in school. Her class was right beside me. So every morning... University. You met her in... Uh, uni uh, college. Yeah. So her class was right beside mine. So every morning I would meet her. When I meet her, I didn't talk to her. I just go like this. Hi. Even, I didn't even say hi. And then uh, it went on for a few days. Then suddenly she came up to me. She's like, let's go out. I'm like, no, what is this? You have a, you have a boyfriend. I, plus, I cannot go out with females. This, this is haram. Because I was very, 
I wanted to change myself. I had a very good mindset. I was very confident. And then she was like, okay, fine. Uh, if you call your friends, we go out with them. Uh, okay, sure. If you really want to go out, fine. I'll, I'll do this. Then I called, I called my child friend. I said, bro, bring your friends. Let's go. He brought my friends. Uh, he brought his friends. And then we all went out together to a restaurant. We were eating. She was sitting extremely close to me. It was scary. Our knees were touching. I was, I was sitting like this. My knees were this close. So uh, that happened. And then I didn't think much. I thought because there were a lot of people, she didn't want to get close to another, uh, other males. I didn't think much. And then uh, she started texting me online. Like we texted. I texted back. And then uh, the next week, the following week, she told me she's very depressed. She said, I broke up. I'm very depressed. I'm like, okay, what do you want me to do? You want, you want food? You want chocolate? She's like, no, I want to come to your house. I'm like, no, 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 you can't. My mom lives with me. He's like, okay, fine. We'll chill in the swimming pool. Did your mother live with you that day? Yeah, my mother was living with me. My mother lived with me for four months in Malaysia. Because she yeah. was very worried. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was like, if you really want to come, fine. It's a one-time thing only. But you sit at the other side, I'll sit at the sorrel. And she was like, okay, fine, whatever. That day, <laughs> I didn't even look at the sorrel. <laughs> I was sitting with her, beside her, we were talking until the morning, 6 p.m. until 7 a.m. Then we took the bus all around the city. Oh, yeah, that day was the happiest. I was very happy in a long time because since I was young, I, I didn't really care about girls. Sure, I was in a relationship once when I was doing her stuff. It was because, well, the girl proposed to me. I couldn't say no. Yeah. <laughs> and then after the, 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 you went out for that day and then? And then we, were, we, we went out on the bus the whole day and then uh, I sent her back home. Then I came back home. We were extremely close. A few weeks later, again, it was Jumma. Uh, it was Friday. I was praying Jumma. After Jumma, she texted me. She's like, did you finish praying? I'm like, yeah, I finished. She's like, come on, let's go up. I said, no, no, I have a lot of assignments today. She said, no, 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 we're not going to a restaurant. Let's go clubbing. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't drink alcohol. I, I don't do this. And the clubs are very smelly. People there are sweaty, very smelly. I told her, and she said, fine, you sit outside in the car, I'll go in. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll accompany you. <laughs> I went there with her. I was sitting outside. It was, it, that day, it was promotion. There was a promotion at the club. Mm -hmm. A couple will get free drinks. Mm -hmm. She was like, come on, let's go. I'm like, no, I don't drink alcohol. She said, fine, I'll, I'll drink both of the cups. I'm like, okay, fine. If you really want me to go, fine. I went in with her. That day I managed to drink three bottles of vodka for the first time. I was, again, I was addicted to alcohol. So in the club I was drinking, then I bought a pack of cigarettes. I was smoking again. I was addicted to both again. But I was not on weed. I was not on drugs. It continued on for months. Every but day. Not that day. But how did you feel after drinking that much? After drinking that much, I was lying in a bush. Mm. Okay, imagine, okay? A very good Muslim with a beard outside a club, beside beside a statue, just lying inside a bush. His head is in the bush. Mm. <laughs> after that? After that, I, I, I slept there until the morning in the bush. Then I slept for the whole night. I slept in the bush the whole night. We slept together. She was also sleeping beside me. And then uh, we went back home. I sent her back home in the morning. I was still drunk. I went home. I was... I couldn't walk straight. I knocked on the door. My mother opened it. She was like, where did you go the whole night? I said, I was doing assignments with my friend. And she said, show me your eyes. Oh. I showed her my eyes. It was red. I was tired. She said, what did you do? Tell me the truth. 
I said, I'm just very tired. I didn't sleep the whole night. I, and then she led me off easy. That day I slept. I slept crazy. I missed classes that day. Mm-hmm. And then the next day, hangover. There was, someone was bashing my brains with hammer. It was your brain was hurting you a lot. Yeah, hangover. Right. So uh, again, the next week we went to club, but this time I didn't drink a lot. I drank like seven, eight cups mm-hmm. of uh, tequila and vodka. That's all. Usually they would serve in shots, short cups. It's like tiny cups. Yeah, but. I got I got a big cup, so I was addicted. Already, the addiction was so bad. I was in class, and I had a plastic water bottle, aqua. The plastic bottle, I put vodka inside the bottle. Oh, in class! In class, I was sitting at the back in the corner. I was drinking alcohol while the teacher was teaching. Nah. I was reeking of alcohol the whole day. And then the following week, uh, we went back to club again. Again, I drank, 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 and then it continued on for days. So it was not Friday anymore. It was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Every day I was in club. I I know all the clubs in Malaysia. <laughs> everywhere, everywhere I go, if they see me, they they are gonna hug me. That's how much I I went there. And then uh, a few months passed by. It was before the exam. I had a fight with them. You had a fight. Fight. I had a fight with her. We stopped talking. <sighs> I was extremely depressed again. So, I went out searching for weed. Mm. But then, there was this guy in my class. I knew him. I knew him because... I knew him because we were talking outside while smoking. Mm-hmm. He said, do you smoke anything other than cigarettes? I went to friends. So I was like, of course, bro. Of course, this is my life. I showed him pictures, and he's like, oh, then you're hanging out with me, come. But that day, I didn't go with him because I was not smoking anymore. But after uh, we stopped talking, the girl and me, we stopped talking. I went to him. I was to his house. I knocked on the door. I was like, bro, do you have some stuff? Because of, you felt sad? Very depressed, yeah. very sad. And then uh, we hit it off a bomb. First time in a long time, in months. Actually, years, first time in years. I hit it off a bong. It was crazy. You hit it off a bong. Oh, okay. A bong. Mm. It was crazy. It was horrible. But I forgot the depression because I was high. But I went back home. When the high dropped, I was depressed twice, two times. Then to stop that depression again, you took I, I went to his house. I took more and more puffs. It continued on for days again. I told him, bro, this is not okay. I'm smoking free from you. This is not okay. You tell me your dealer. I'll talk to him personally. I'll get products from him. Mm. He gave me his dealer. And then I would I would get I would go crazy with the dealer. I got six hundred ringgit a month. So this is not enough. So what I did I bought vodka, then uh, I bought ethanol, rubbing alcohol. When you get wounds, you rub oh, like a medicine? Yeah, yeah, like medicine. Yeah. It's alcohol. I would mix it in plastic bottles, then I would sell it in class, in school. Mm. People would go crazy for it. I was making 6K, 7K a month, easy, easy money. I started buying drugs, drugs, more and more uh, weed. Then I got an idea. I was like, alcohol is bad for selling. By that time, I stopped drinking alcohol. Let me sell something else instead. I started selling weed mm-hmm. in Malaysia. Uh, it was, it was so crazy. You selling to make money to buy more for yourself. Yes. It was so crazy. I met a lot of, uh, lot of these gang leaders, these st- crazy people. They They were personally talking to me they were recruiting me and all that stuff because I had a very good business mind I was making a lot of money but I never worked under any of them we were just business partners <laughs> okay so uh, 
I was doing weed and then the effects were not working on me anymore. I was not getting high. It was like smoking cigarettes. Nothing yep. was happening. So again, I said I started searching for more drugs. So I would go to these gang members. I would tell them, bro, I need more. I need something stronger than weed. It was the first time I injected something into my body. Never done this before. Injection. Injection. I've never done this before. And uh, when I see it in movies, I skip the skin. I skip the scene because it was stupid. But I was doing it myself. I wasn't thinking. I I don't know what I was thinking, man. I I was doing it myself. Then from that, uh, I started getting more and more drugs from him. Different type of drugs, powder, rocks, everything. Then uh, it was time my my mom moved out already. Then uh, I moved to a dormitory type thing. It was a shared room, so I was living alone. It was like freedom. It was, <laughs> I was completely free. There was no one to be scared of. I went crazy with the drugs. After semester break, uh, the school was starting again, but before school started. That one particular night, I was very close to overdosing. Very close. I was on three different types of drugs. Well, what's overdosing? Overdosing is uh, when you use too much drug and like your heart stops, then it starts foaming at your mouth, then you die. Mm. I was very close to dying. Uh, but that night, I, I know how to control overdosing. So I controlled it, then I went to sleep. <sighs> that that day, I had a dream. It was a crazy dream. Mm. So in the dream, I was sleeping. I was still in the top. Everything was exactly the same. I felt like I was awake. You know? It, I, I felt like I was awake. My soul. My soul was me. I could see my body there. Okay, so I was standing here. I could see my body on the bed. I was dead in my dream. I was dead. The people, the people were uh, tying me up. Yeah, to bury you. Yeah, to bury me. And then they buried me. I could see the whole process, everything. They buried me, and then when they left, that's when it starts to get scary. The grief squeezed in on me. Mm. I was a white ball. You know what I felt? Mm. My bones were grinding against me. Imagine your ribs crushed into a ball. You're still alive. You're still feeling it. You're not dying. Crushed into a ball. I was crying in my dream. I was screaming. I was screaming. I was crying. My pillows were wet from tears. 3 a.m. I woke up. When I woke up, immediately what I did, I took all the drugs. I flushed it down the toilet. I'm done with this. That day I prayed from 3, 3 a.m. all the way until 8 a.m. In a very long time, in years, I prayed again. But this time, I wasn't stressed about the exams or anything, so the withdrawals were crazy. One second, I was in a corner shaking. It was freezing. I would be putting on sweaters. Then the next second, I would be drenched in sweat. It was hot. So I... I was naked in my room, shaking. Then uh, I tried my hardest to pray five times a day. Because I promised Allah, I promised him, I will leave everything for the sake of Allah. It was, it was narrated that when you leave something for the sake of Allah, you get something way better. So I, I, I left all this Tanya stuff, all this Haram stuff. Then I went to pray. I even missed Fajr in 65 days. Alhamdulillah. I prayed, prayed, prayed. Then I stopped talking to all my old friends. I stopped talking to these guys that were supplying me Haram stuff. These gang members, I cut them off. Then uh, I was praying. Then I met a few friends in the Surah. Amazing guys. These these guys, 
I've never seen some. I've never seen people like them. My first actual friends, aside from the aside from my best friend, which I still talk to until this day, you, these guys are like the best people ever. So the best guys you found them in the surah, which is a I found them in the masjid. Yeah. Yes, that day I remember it was asr, I, asr or maghrib, I don't remember, but it was during that time. I went to the surah for the first time, because I've never I never roam around my uh, building. I went to the surah for the first time. I saw this guy. I prayed with him. Then after prayer, I saw him. Uh, he was making dua. I have never seen someone make dua like that. So I told him, brother, make dua for me. And then he said, you make dua for me. And then somehow I said with him, I told him my whole life story. Then, <laughs> Okay, so, like, if, if, if anyone... Who's going through the same struggle? What should he he do? Like, what are the things that will, you know, make him get over this addiction? If you're if you're a child still, and so bring the mark close. If you're like a child still, and say <laughs> it's important, you you're willing to speak with the people elder than you, your mother. But, your not your child. If you yourself are addicted. If if it was myself, I'd say to. Make the right friends and to do the basic things Allah asks of you so that He can He can bless you back. It's very basic things. It's our it's praise Allah on time, we said the Quran a few times and remember him. For everything that we have, it's it's very little things. If you if and the only way you can make these right friends is when you're doing these things. When you're doing these things, you're attracting the people around you. Why? Because if you're going to pray on time, where are you going to go? To the masjid. Mm. You go to the masjid, then you see the people who who are like-minded, who are, th- who are fearful of Allah, and are willing to avoid the wrong, to choose the right. That's the only way you're going to surround yourself with the right people. In some cases, it might even bring opportunities that you never imagined. SubhanAllah. It's it's literally small things like you know, when I was a kid, I didn't understand why am I, am I going to the masjid every day to pray? Why? Because I was only going because my parents were shouting at me. They were shouting at me and saying, "Go to go to salah, or you'll be in jahannam tomorrow." <laughs> you you can't make them understand it like that. You have to make them understand it in the way that these are the little things Allah asks of you to bless you in different ways. So we're just praying five times a day in the in Jama'at. Start Mahat. there. Not just, not just five, five times a day. Start there. Start with Salah and everything else will fall in place. All, all, in, all, all that matters is that you start there and then you let everything fall in place from there. Mm. You, can't, you, can't, you can't do everything. You can't fix all your problems in life at once. You can, you can never... You can never uh, if you do that, you're superhuman. I don't think anyone is able to do that. So if if you if you want to solve problem number one today, it's just one simple solution: go for salah and vent your problems out to Allah, not not your friends, not your not your not your girlfriend or whoever is there in your life, or not not all those people. This is where just just ask Allah for for help, because who else is actually going to help you? Who else made this world? Who else gave us this life? Who else, who else give us all the opportunity to be able to still be living? Well, if we, if we wake up tomorrow, then we only have one person to thank for. And he only asks us for one simple thing. Do your salah. SubhanAllah. What would you advise for someone who wants to stop addi- the addiction of drugs? So people who want to stop, I'll tell you exactly how I stop. It was, if you don't have the dream, fine. If, if you don't get the dream, it's okay. Don't worry about it. There's one other way. I did this method also. I called my father to Malaysia. I didn't tell him anything on the phone. But you called your father to yeah. come to Malaysia? To come to Malaysia. I told him, come to Malaysia. I want to talk to you. He's, he was very curious. He said, talk to me on the phone. I said, no, this is important method. Come. Aside from your family, 
no one, no one, literally no one in this world will give you the same treatment. Your parents, your mom and your dad, they will give their life for their children. But it's very scary for someone to speak to their parents about these type of things. They, wh- what would they do? They couldn't do anything. If, if you're still doing it, of course you'll get whooped. But if you stop, if you stop really, if you're trying to stop, they will help you. They will help you stop. Aside from them, who, who, do, you, who do you go to? Your friends? If you go to your friends, what do all they do? They will, they will be like, oh, this is so bad. They will just talk to you. Your family, they will help you physically to stop. So what I did, I called my dad. I told him, when he came here, I told him, let's go Genting Highlands. I want to relax for a few days. Mm-hmm. So I went with him to Genting Highland, and on the road there, it was, that day was, it was a public holiday. So the traffic jam <laughs> was crazy. I was, I was in the car for four hours. I went to Genting. On the road there, I told him everything. I did not leave a single thing out. Since I was 13, I told him what I have done. Even stealing money from him. The whole trip after I finished, did not say a single word. Mm, it was shocking. Imagine how nervous I was. I couldn't see his emotion. His, his face was straight. <laughs> then, uh... I arrived to Genting Island the next day. In the morning, he said, are you still doing it? First thing he said, are you still doing it? (laughs) I said, no, not anymore. Instead, I'm even more religious now. He was, I could see how proud he was. He was very proud. He was extremely happy. So uh, if you're trying to quit, just go for it. Just go, go to your parents. You don't have to, like, you don't you don't say this I, I'll quit tomorrow I'm, I'm I'm smoking one less puff no 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 this, this is never going to work mm. just quit immediately but maybe quitting like making it less less is better what do you think uh, I wouldn't no I mean some people would enjoy that but never worked for you never worked my my suggestion it never works it's it's useless you shouldn't even be addicted in the first place. But if you get addiction, if you get addicted, just stop immediately. And then repent. Pray Salah. Read Quran. Mm-hmm. Maki, I forgot how to read Quran. It was that bad. I forgot how to pray Salah. I forgot the Tashahud. I forgot everything. I started praying again. I started reading the Quran. The surahs I memorized. It all started coming back to me. I don't even need to read it. It all came back to me. Every day I would be crying in front of Allah. I was weeping like a child. Please, uh, I, I would do up. Please remove all the hate inside my heart. Please don't let shaitan destroy me. The was it's, it's it's a crazy thing. Uh, you mentioned about the withdrawal effects. Does that go away after some time? Of course. It goes away. Give it 40 days. 40 days? 40 days. You know why you get withdrawals? The drugs are still in your system. And also, it's also written in the Quran. Is it? Yeah. Mm. For 40 days, you cannot pray. Because mm. it's in your system. You drink alcohol, you cannot pray 40 days. SubhanAllah. The drugs also the same. It's in your system. It's, it's circulating. So, the effects, you still feel it. Randomly, you start getting high. But after 40 days, trust me, personal experience, you completely, you, you, you will be better. You will be more than better. Is there any final advices you would like to share with other people? Praise Allah. Praise Allah. Do zikr. Repent to Allah. Allah is the most merciful. Many, many years before he created the heavens and the earth, he writes... On his, uh, how would you call it, a tablet? My mercy is greater than my anger. Just pray. It's, it's, it's not such a difficult thing. Dedicate one hour in 24 hours. There is 24 hours in a day. Dedicate just one hour to prayer. It's just one hour. It's not going to hurt you. It's going to benefit you more. Mm, it's fine. I need As a friend group, <laughs> sorry, and the friend group, 
when you're sitting in a friend group, always have one thought. Am I going to Jannah or Jahannam with them? Because uh, after Akhirat, you go to Jannah or Jahannam with the groups, in the groups. So you think, am I going to Jannah or Jahannam? Be friends with the right people. Be friends with people that pulls you for Salah, that comes and knocks on your door for Fajr. Be friends with them. That's, these are the best type of friends. Yeah, that's so true. Any advices? Last advice you'd like to <laughs> Maybe start realizing who you really have to thank for. Uh, it's not it's not the lecturer who gave you an A plus for your exam. It's not it's not the friend who was uh, who was laughing with you yesterday. It's not it's not any of those. Start realizing who you really have to thank for, and start realizing all that you have to thank for until now. Because if you start looking at your life, you start realizing that. You have more than you ever realized before. There's only one person to thank for. And when you realize who you have to thank, which is Allah, you start to realize if you were if you were if you have this much without even thanking him one percent, how much will he give you if you really thank him from now onwards? The possibilities are endless. So start realizing who you really have to thank for and then Maybe everything in your life will get fixed. Thank you. Jazakumullah khair and kathira. Really thank you for sharing your stories with us. I know for sure that there's a lot of benefit for other people listening to this. Jazakumullah khair. One final advice before we all leave. This dunya is, think of this as a hotel. You check in when you are born. You're going to check out one day. This is a hotel. What do you do in a hotel? You uh, follow hotel, the rules. Yeah. Mm. You follow the rules of the hotel. The rules in this dunya, pray, be a good Muslim. That's all. That's that's my final advice. This is a test. You're preparing for the final exam. The final exam, three questions only in the grief. Who is your God? Who is your prophet? What is your religion? You answer these three questions, mashallah, you're, you, you, you pass the exam. <laughs> okay, Zakallah, okay. Zakallah, subhanallah.